You may be seated. And at this time, I would call forward anyone who was elected um, at our annual congregational meeting uh, to any of our offices and also our synod delegate.
it would now be said to confide the earth together. I confess to Almighty God, one of the Holy Trinity, who knows the innermost secrets of my heart, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my fault, by my own regret fault. In your presence, O God, I earnestly repent for all my wrongdoings, and am hard and sorry that I have offended you. Most merciful Father, have mercy on me, forgive me, and pardon me my sins. I resolve to amend my life, improve my second life, and I may become worthy to serve you faithfully all the days of my life. I beseech you, blessed Son of Mary, all the saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray to the Lord our God for me. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, absolution, and the remission of our sins. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and by his authority vested in me, I absolve you of your sins, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, you will again renew us. Amen. Show us, O Lord, your mercy. O Lord, hear our prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Take away from us our iniquities and deceit, O Lord, that the pure heart may enter into the tabernacle of the Holy of Holies, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have come away, but behold, new things have come. And Lord, for us your wounds were suffered. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. be merciful and forgiving to those who wrong us and to love others as you have loved us. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The lesson prescribed by the Church for this morning's Holy Mass is taken from St. Paul's Epistle to the Philippians. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attain, obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it known, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the lesson prescribed by the Church for this morning's Holy Mass. Thanks be to God. The days of the Lord are not exhausted, and mercies are not spent. They are renewed each morning, so great is his faithfulness. Merciful and gracious is the Lord, slow to anger and abounding in kindness. Almighty and eternal God, who cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. Cleanse my heart and my lips through your gracious mercy, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips, that I may worthily proclaim his holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Early in the morning, Jesus arrived.
arrived again in the temple area, all the people started coming to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle of the circle. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him so that they could give some charge, or they would have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and he said to all of them, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. Again he bent down and wrote on the ground. In a response, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And so Jesus was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she replied, No one, sir. And then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, from, go and from now on, sin no more. By the words of this holy gospel, may our sins be forgiven. Today. 
Some pundits are saying that the uncertainty of change is what is behind the often embarrassing spectacle of this year's <coughs> presidential campaign. We don't know what tomorrow holds, and we're getting fed up with the way it is today, so we're looking for all kinds of answers. And then there's the president of Hampshire College. He was quoted the same in the paper that 70% of today's college graduates will be working at jobs that don't even exist right now. You know, that's okay if you're 20 something. That's okay if you have a chance at an education, but it can be unnerving if you don't have those opportunities. And so this change in society is leading to greater and greater economic disparity. When I was 10 years old, when I was an altar boy in Westfield, kneeling at that St. Joseph's altar, 70% of us, when I was 10, belonged to the middle class. Now that I'm in my mid-50s, that number has been dropped to 43%. Both the rich and the poor, their numbers have doubled in that same period. When the middle class was 73%, when we were a large portion of American society, the rich and the poor, we were interacting a lot more. Now, more often than not, the rich are in their gated communities and the poor are in their own gated communities and ghettos where everybody else is too afraid to even enter. And so the rich and the poor have been pulled apart and neither one understands the other. We're becoming a separated people. And the separation is also part of the reason why Jesus is disappearing. The University of Michigan surveyed high school seniors recently, and they discovered that church attendance is dropping twice as fast in the poorest third of Americans as in the richest third. You know, there was a, a movie, I think it was called Coach Carter, and he was a basketball coach in a very, very economically deprived area. And he comes in with his suit jacket and his tie. And when the kids first saw him, they said, are you a preacher man or something like that? Mm -hmm. And you know, they thought that he was a man of God. And one of the kids on the team said to him, you know, preacher, God ain't going to do you any good on these streets out here. And so that idea that God is so far away from these kids' lives that God doesn't matter, that is starting to spread. I wonder if it has anything to do with that sense of futility, maybe even hopelessness, that Jesus is not real in their lives. In the same article where I was reading about that survey from Michigan University, there was, a, uh, there was an interview there with a woman, and she works as a housekeeper in a posh downtown hotel. She sees the wealth of the wealthy every single day, and she knows that she doesn't have any chance at it. And what's even more depressing is she thinks that her children don't have any chance at it. In her words, I try to play the lottery here and there. You've got to have something. So Jesus was always there for the most desperate. Jesus was always a source of hope for the most desperate. And what if that's beginning to change? What if the very people that Jesus came to serve and to save, they no longer feel a connection to him? What if they feel absolutely hopeless? That's a question that we have to ask on Passion Sunday when we remember that even 2,000 years ago, you know, God was pushed out of society. Are we doing the same thing today? You know, there was another time when the world wanted nothing at all to do with Jesus. During World War II, the Nazis tried to either erase or tame the Christian church because it's hard to glorify hatred and killing and prejudice when you hear sermons about Jesus and his life and his gospel. But some in the church, they fought back. And one of the heroes of that religious resistance was a Lutheran pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he would not let the Nazis win, at least not in his life. And for this, he was in prison. And on Hitler's orders, he was executed just two weeks before the Americans liberated his concentration camp in 1945. Even in the blackness of a Nazi prison, Bonhoeffer saw Christ. And from his cell, he once smuggled out this note to a friend. I always have the feeling that we are merely fearfully trying to save some room for God. I would rather speak of God at the center rather than at the limits. The church is found not where human capacity fails at the very limits, but rather in the middle of the village. And I wonder if this has also anything to do with the diminishing importance of Christ in a church. I wonder if we, even as active Christians, I wonder if we settle for a Jesus in a church that is locked into only any leftover time, any leftover space that we have in our lives. That church is not a priority. Church is not a dissension. But if we've got a spare Sunday, if we've got a spare moment, if we've got a spare dollar, God gets whatever is left over. If we keep pushing Jesus 
farther and farther towards the edge. Well, then it's going to be easier for Jesus and church to fall over that edge without very much noise at all. And then you've got a world without Christ. But like I said, Jesus' departure from the world was only a tactical retreat that allowed him to come charging back. We are Jesus' church. We are Jesus. We're his presence in the world, and we cannot settle for this any more than Jesus could. The image of this sanctuary, it should disturb us. And not only to the point of wringing our hands and admitting that this course is inevitable, that there's nothing we can do. We are Jesus' the church. We are Jesus in the world. We need to bring him back to the middle of the village, as Bonhoeffer said, from the darkness of a Nazi prison. If he could see Jesus there, we have to be able to see Jesus here. The world still needs to hear Jesus of today's gospel. The religious authorities of today's gospel, they come dragging this powerless woman to Jesus. They want him to join their condemnation. Imagine this, this group of men, this, this mob of men dragging this one woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Now, I've never been an adulterer, but I know that if you're caught in the act of adultery, there's not only one woman involved, there's somebody else. Where's the somebody else? The mob only grabs the woman. Is the man too powerful? He's left behind? So they grab this woman and they bring her to Jesus. And in the temple area, stoning is a brutal way to kill somebody. I mean, you're not taking a rock that fits like this. You are taking boulders and you are willing to stand around that person and you throw the boulders at that person until they are bludgeoned to death. It is a brutal way to die. It's a savage way to die. And this is what they wanted Jesus to condone. And so that poor woman is there. And they ask Jesus to join in their condemnation and Jesus just starts writing in the sand. What is he writing? Is he writing out the fullness of the commandment? That you know, both the man and the woman should die? And that maybe one of these Pharisees, maybe one of these rulers, maybe one of these priests also should be in the middle of that circle being stoned to death? Or is he writing down names? Maybe you know, the, who is that person? Maybe I know that person. And when he says, only the one without sin can cast that first stone, they all know that they have sinned in their own way and they all walk away. And then that poor woman, confused, terrified, doesn't know what to do, bewildered, you know, she's left there alone with Jesus. And finally Jesus says to her, neither do I condemn you. You know, too often the church is the one that kind of points out our faults and our failures. Too often the church is the one condemning this or condemning that, or at least people of faith are doing that because they seem to do it with such zeal that, you know, we're always calling somebody else a sinner, but we don't look at ourselves. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. That is our path back into the middle of the village. That is the way that we become relevant again by preaching this message of a God that we have in Jesus. Not a God who rushes towards human judgment, but a God who is merciful and loving. This is the Jesus that the church needs to be, that we have to be. This is the Jesus that has the power and the message to come charging back into the world to find our place and our purpose. So may we pray this Passion Sunday that we may believe strongly enough in the Jesus that we can bring into the world to bring him and us back into the middle of the village because this cannot last if we really believe that we are Christ. And for this we pray in his most holy of names, this Passion Sunday. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Almighty Lord, we have now entered into the Passion Tide. We offer you our thanks for all that you have endured for your love for us, even though too often we don't return that love. As we gather now before your altar, we offer our prayers in memory of uh, Bernie Earl Kale, brother of Marianna Foster, on the very first anniversary of his death, March 17th. We also continue to offer our prayers for the following who are battling cancer. Doug Robinson is offered by daughter Jenny Whitman and Karen Herzig. Tom Nidal by Teresa Belisle. Meg Connors by Ellen and Don Skrosky. Marie Logan and Carl Dickinson by Joe and Peg Pustchuk. Brandy Clemens by her grandmother Dottie Baronis. Max, a three-year-old, now hospitalized in Boston by a friend. And fathers Raymond Drader 
Jan Bielczek and Maurice Lozell is offered by myself, and also Benjamin St. George is offered by Teresa Mazik. And finally, our prayers for Frank Skrosky, diagnosed with PSP, a neurological disease, is offered by his twin brother Don and the Skrosky, Gates, and Kirkendall families. Are there any prayers from the congregation? For all of these prayers, Lord, plus the private ones that we bring before your altar, we also ask you to bless each and every one of us here gathered, and also to be with those who are parish who are unable to be with us here today, and those who are parish who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Thou who hast suffered wounds for us, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in all our God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being the Father, through him all things are made, for us and for our salvation.
sins that my sacrifice and yours may be accepted to God, the Father Almighty. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, receive the gifts of your people gathered here together, and instill in us the virtues of tolerance and of forgiveness. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Throughout all ages of ages. For their sins I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. 
that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. After these and other words of the archpriest of prayer and of holy fervor, our Savior took bread into his holy and venerable hand, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and eat of this, for this is my body. Like manner after supper, taking also this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again giving thanks to you, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, All of you take and drink of this, for this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith, which for you and for many shall be shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you shall do these things, do them in remembrance of me. We receive from your own gifts and presents a pure offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of eternal salvation. These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance, as from him who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts, and with an unshakable faith that they will become for our souls a saving remedy. We humbly beseech you, Almighty God, command that our prayers be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your highest altar before the countenance of your divine majesty. That as many of us as receive this altar of the most sacred body and blood of your Son may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be mindful also, Lord, of your servants and handmaids, all who have gone before us with the sign of faith and have passed on to eternity. <coughs> These souls, O Lord, is also to those who have died in Christ, grant everlasting life, and to those who during life strayed from the path of righteousness, unmindful of your fatherly love, mercifully showing their sufferings who beseech you, in the name of Christ our Lord and your beloved Son. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope in the greatness of your mercy, some part in fellowship with your holy apostles, martyrs, and all your saints, who shed their blood for your name's sake, whose hearts are always open to justice and mercy and whose lives patterned after the divine master merited eternal bliss. Number us, O Lord, in their company, with confidence we ask you, not because of our merits, but that you bestow forgiveness through Christ our Lord, by whom, O Lord, these gifts you always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and bestow upon us all these good things. Through him, and with him, and in him, to you, God, the Father Almighty, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and all glory. Throughout all ages of ages, let us pray, admonished by salutary precepts and following divine institution, we make bold to say,
it necessary to test us, grant us the same serenity of spirit, which you bestow on the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed apostles, martyrs, and all of those who resolutely marched under the banner of our Savior, that being supported by your help, may always be free from sin and secure from all despair. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God. Throughout all ages of ages,
forgive. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, through his death on the cross, your son Jesus has merited forgiveness of all of our sins. Through your holy word and this holy Eucharist, we have been unburdened of a shameful path. So may we now serve you with a renewed devotion. We ask it through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever.